Hello, everyone. Uh, I want to welcome you to the second module of the Design Educators Typography Intensive. I'm Gloria Kondrup, and I'm the Executive Director of the Hoffman Smokin Center for Typography. I also want to thank our co-sponsor, Google, for making this happen, and also to thank the uh, Lowell Milken Family Foundation. Um, the Design Intensive really continues the legacy of Professor Leah Hoffmitz at Art Center College of Design. She was a skilled educator and she had a profound dedication to teaching and her desire to give back to her students and fellow educators. And she was intensely in interested in the effects of technology and changing cultural influences on the design of letter forms, typography, and the role that it has in visual communication. And she really believed that effective teaching should be shared and not kept. So today's module, which is this afternoon's module, which is um, teaching essential typography, I have with me probably I would consider the finest tag team ever, typography tag team, Professor Ty Drake and Professor Simon Johnston from Art Center College of Design. And they are both also faculty directors within the department. They teach both the undergraduate and graduate levels of typography. Um, they will take you through what I would consider, we call this an intensive for a reason, because it's going to be intense. Um, I would say what would be the typical um, learning and typography schedule that our center students go through in terms of learning typography. Um, at the end of this, um, hopefully we'll have some time for discussion and Q&A. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to, to Ty and to Simon who are gonna take you on what I would consider be a very, very intense typographic journey. So, gentlemen. Thank you, Gloria. There we go. Okay, um, well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, these are strange times, but we do what we can, and uh, I hope you're all doing well. I know I saw some chat notes coming up there, and I think we have some visitors from far afield. So, uh, welcome to all of you. Um, a little note about, um, structure uh, of Ty uh, and myself, what we're going to be doing today. Um, we'll be, as Gloria mentioned, um, thank you for the introduction, we'll be tag teaming. Um, I'll be doing 20 minutes talking about the general, a general overview of the curriculum. Um, and then Ty will go into de more detail on type one and two. Um, I'll then follow up with type three and four uh, classes. Ty will then, uh, tell us about some of the typography classes in the grad program. Um, and then we'll uh, spend 10 minutes or so if we have that time to just give a little bit of a summary. Um, greetings from Southern California. This was a solar powered cover. We can do that in Southern California for a, a, a school catalog, a college catalog a few years back. Um, I'm gonna start by just giving um, a very, uh, just a, a general overview uh, of the typography curriculum. Um, I've said it before, but typography is the spine. We like to think that typography is the spine that runs through the body of graphic design practice. Um, it's what language looks like, uh, and it's the means, the tools by which all of human knowledge is, is communicated. So, um, our curriculum um, is uh, based on a sort of core sequence that you're looking at here of classes. Um, you can see from the diagram that uh, in yellow here are the core classes. These are um, mandatory classes. These are required classes. Um, certainly that what type one, two, three, four sequence uh, and five, uh, all students take those one, two, three, four, five classes. Um, you'll see down below, there are also typography classes that we call elective classes. Um, letterpress, advanced lettering, digital font design, uh, type and authorship. These are available for students to take and uh, are encouraged to do so if they, if they have the, the time and energy amongst all the other activities. Um, also on this diagram are, um, for example, if you look above type four, there's, there are alternate versions of type four which relate more to a motion track or to interaction um, as well that, that, are, that are available to students. Um, in the orange uh, boxes here are classes that I would say do relate to typo typography. They, they, they follow on from the core 
um, and I'm calling core classes one to four, um, they follow on from those classes, but they're often very heavily involved in, in typographic decision making and they connect to the core type classes and build up to them. Um, in a way, uh, at the top as well, you'll see some academic classes that also involve typography. So this is an overview of the undergraduate program as far as it touches on matters typographic. Um, because type uh, one and two are gonna be covered by Ty in more detail uh, in a minute, and then type three and four by myself in, in a few minutes, um, I wanted to just give you an overview of uh, what happens to students once they've been through that core program, what other opportunities and, and classes uh, they can take that are largely typographically driven, I would say. So we're gonna take a look at a few of these classes from, from the other um, sections here. Um, I'm keeping an eye on the time, trying to keep within our um, 20 minute slots that uh, we, we've been talking about. Um, so um, amongst one of the electives, you'll see their letterpress um, at Archetype Press. Uh, I include this here not only because it's uh, a class in itself that students can take, but we believe it to be fundamental to a student's understanding of uh, typography. Um, it's important, for example, within type one classes, as Ty will discuss, that they have an overview of all typographic technologies, where a lot of the terminology comes from, and understanding of uh, the structure and nature of form and space, um, horizontal and vertical intervals, and so forth. Um, what we're seeing here at the moment, th these are pictures of Alan Kitching and Kelvin Smith, who were um, uh, our artists in residence at, at Archetype Press. Um, uh, earlier this year, um, before the pandemic. Uh, I can't believe we managed to get it in. Um, so the importance of this class, uh, type, type one students do spend a couple of weeks uh, in, in the press to understand something about letter forms, uh, understand the physical, physicality and, and understand where it comes from. Even this slide is reminding me, for example, the fact that um, you know, point size is not the cap height of the type. Uh, point size is equal to body size. That's the, the space above and below. So um, seeing the physicality of the forms, working with the discipline of, of uh, letterpress technologies actually slows them down and helps them to understand um, some of the basic um, things they need to understand about type, knowing that obviously in, in, in the digital realm, these, these parameters, these body sizes still exist, but they're all invisible in, in, in the digital field. Um, Identity systems is a class that I also teach where we often have a lot of um, typographic solutions that come, come from it. Again, these are um, fourth and sometimes fifth term students. So they've already been through the core typographic um, classes, but they're then able in situations like this to come up with, um, this was for example, a, um, an, ex an identity for an experimental theater company, ETC. Um, very lively exploration. Um, of uh, the possibilities of what can be done with an identity, but typographically driven and fueled by experiments and exercises and so forth in the first few, few classes. Um, an identity for artificial intelligence association. Um, in this class, they also start to experiment with um, different types of displays, even getting into some generative and um, you know, physical um, uh, experiential sort of um, versions of, the, of their marks. This is then carried on later when they do type five transmedia and obviously Brad Bartlett will be talking about transmedia in another module tomorrow, I believe. So this starts to, to get them to that point where they can play with uh, other materials. So typography becomes, um, they're introduced to this notion of identity possibly being typographic um, in earlier classes. I'll talk about that in a little while to do with um, Oh, I just saw, I think in, in a note earlier, I think someone was from Sao Paulo. Um, welcome. Uh, this was an identity done for Rio, the Olympics in 2016. Um, I digress. Uh, but a lot of typographically driven solutions happen uh, in these classes, as I say, fueled by earlier um, studies in the, in the core type classes. Um, Information design, another class, um, which might also be called analytical design. Um, I've taught this in the past as well, uh, not at the moment. Again, analysis, research, um, uh, arguments being um, put out in typographic form, 
Um, often in, in environmental situations, Ty, I know, has some examples of working within environmental and spatial considerations. So that can sometimes happen in these classes. Here's one of my, my uh, kind of favorite analytical pieces that was done in an information design class. This was a little while back, but it's, it was, uh, the student did a, a study of, uh, I guess, a survey of every single sign in the old, uh, in 1974 Helvetica uh, signed campus uh, on the Hillside campus. So this is every, every sign that uses Helvetica in that building at the, the size and the height that it appeared, um, all then overlaid. So it's a really nice example of what I would call systems thinking, um, typographically driven, but um, a beautiful uh, end result. We'll talk a little bit more about um, systems in, in one other class. Um, again, type studies for uh, information design projects. I won't dwell on these too much, but clearly the sense of order and structure um, that we're seeing apparent in some of these later studies um, grows directly out of, uh, well, all the way back to initial studies that they do in type one and, 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 and type two, where, um, shall we say, well, we can talk about that a little bit more uh, later, but order and uh, structure are not just drilled into people, but we make them see the value of um, the fact that when we're, when we're creating typographic forms and structures. Um, it's not just a question of, of grids being, being useful, it's a question of us wanting to communicate in a way that appears to be and has intelligence behind it. So order and sequence and hierarchy uh, really reveal kinds of intelligence in the material, make us want to take it uh, seriously and want to, want to deal with things. Um, I skipped ahead there. Um, we also have a digital font design class um, uh, run by Greg Lindy, who does a fabulous job. Students go through a process of um, developing a whole fonts, um, sometimes developing different, different weights if they have time. Um, there's also a second version uh, if, of this class if people want to really pursue it further. Um, there's also a class called advanced letter form design, um, where it's more driven more by hand drawn forms. Uh, which then gets subsequently digitized, obviously. Um, uh, I'm not sure whether Niels is still going to be teaching this. Um, so this is very much dependent upon having a, an instructor that knows how to, how to do this kind of thing. And those skills are slowly disappearing, I suspect. Um, we also have a class uh, I, along the electives there. And it's, it's, I think I'm just introducing you to all of these things because I think it's useful to think of different um, pedagogical models, shall we say. Um, if you are teaching in, a, in a, um, a situation where you don't have the time and um, we, we're, we're kind of, we have a lot of, uh, I guess, luxury in terms of time. Our typographic curriculum is quite extensive uh, and we give a lot of options and choices to people. But if you only have, for example, the ability to give one class or two classes, how can, you, how can you deal with the basics? How can you deal with essentials? What, what possible pedagogical models might there be? We'll talk more about that a little, little bit later on, but I'm showing you some of these uh, classes just because they, they provide a different uh, model. This, this class, for example, Type in Authorship, as the name suggests, uh, it's an elective class, but really it's a, it's a collaborative, collective um, class, different departments, not just graphic design can take part. So essentially the students in that class become a team. They put out, um, uh, and they actually have printed at the end of the term, they become an editorial team, they become a design team, and sometimes they're working with their own um, writings, as the, as the name suggests. So in terms of authorship, they, they work with um, other instructors to um, you know, write materials and then edit and design. So they become a little sort of publication team. Um, so as a model, that's quite, a, quite interesting, rather than the individuals working on their own, they're, they're, work, they're learning how to collaborate, learning how to share responsibilities or delegate, uh, work with editors, um, and at the end of the term, produce a printed piece. So um, in itself, that's an intriguing um, possibility. There's always a, you know, typically it's a cheap, cheaply printed newsprint kind of uh, thing, but it's, it's a pretty interesting um, approach to uh, deep dives into ty typographic material. Um, so there, there we see um, the overview of, of um, the undergraduate um, program. Um, not listed here, obviously, as the, the, the type classes in the graduate program. 
And I should add as well that um, a couple of things that have, that have happened over the last few years um, might be of interest to those of you within education, um, the educational field already, uh, in the sense that we've had increasingly, the department has had a lot of uh, requests from other departments, um, illustration in particular, for example, um, students wanting to take uh, type one and type two classes to get a, uh, some understanding of, of typography. Sometimes they, they fall in love and switch to our department. Sometimes they, they're happy to have, um, you know, a, a modicum of training uh, in typography to understand it, to in introduce it into their work. Um, so we've had to think about how we can establish, shall we say, shorter um, typographic modules. Uh, let's say a student, an illustration student, can only take type one and type two. Um, are they structured in such a way that they're useful for them? I would say generally that we like to think that learning typography is like learning a language. Um, what I mean by that, it has its own grammar, its own syntax and vocabulary, um, that you can start with no knowledge of that language and really develop and build that knowledge. Um, obviously, the ultimate goal is to become fluent in that language, to carry the analogy further. Um, you want to be able to have to control over it to, to be able to say what you want it, what you want it to say. So if you, if you need it to be, if you need the typographic voice to be poetic, you can do that. If you need it to be scientific, you can do that. If you need it to be, I don't know, humanistic, whatever that might, might be, then you have control over the typography in order to be able to find that, that tone of voice. Um, we, we believe, as you can see from what we're looking at here as well, that it's a cumulative process. Um, the assignments, which we'll see, um, are um, designed to work. Uh, there's always a bit of overlap, but type, type one exercises are designed then to be followed by type two. Um, all of those classes are prerequisites for, for one another. So you can't take type two unless you've taken type one. You can't take type three unless you've taken type two and so forth. So all instructors who are teaching these classes have a set of, uh, and we'll talk more about this. Um, there are learning outcomes, uh, required learning outcomes. We'll take a look at some of those. Um, there's a certain amount of flexibility in terms of how those learning outcomes can happen. So long as they're achieved, the assignments can can vary. So um, that's up to individual instructors, their preferences and so forth. Um, but the idea is it's cumulative. Um, so, and again, back to the language analogy, the idea is that, you know, it's, it's the more typographic decisions you make, the better you get at making them. Um, that we believe very much in exercises and, and, and shall we say repetition. Um, repetition doesn't sound sexy, but it actually works. Um, and um, in this goal, it's rather like, you know, when you're learning, literally learning another language. I'm trying to take Italian classes right now. Um, but it's like learning the scales on the piano. You need to go through the process. Um, you need to really do a deep dive and, and work in, on, on repetition. So a lot of type one, two, three, four, that sequence uh, is about that. Uh, they tend to, we tend to start with projects that have a little more tighter parameters and then open up to allow students to generate their own material a little bit later on. We'll be talking more about that um, later. Um, I'm looking at my clock here. It says 20 past. That means I should shut up and hand over to Ty. All right. Hey, thank you, Simon. Um, sure. And thank you, Gloria, for that prestigious welcome. Wow. Uh, <laughs> one of the best tag teams. Wow. Simon, I didn't know we were a tag team, but uh, I'll be on a team with you any day. Um, <laughs> It's a deal. <laughs> so thank you. Um, so um, going, picking a piggyback into what Simon said, uh, what Simon says, um, uh, let me escape from that again. Um, so I teach in both the undergraduate as well as the graduate um, uh, type of uh, graphic design program. And uh, what I teach in those programs is especially in the undergraduate program as Simon said is I, I teach to type two class but I just want to go through really quickly uh, sort of an overview of sort of the foundation courses just for type one and type two some of which Simon just went over um, and I want to preface this by saying um, I, I was I was a student at Art Center in the mid 90s um, and I graduated in 1996 and it was that era of sort of, and I talk about this all the time because I can't talk about typography myself personally without talking about the influence of 
you know, deconstructed typography and what people sometimes label grunge, grunge typography uh, in the 90s on the work that I was doing when I got to Art Center. Um, so uh, the, the type two class that I actually teach, I actually uh, took myself when I was at Art Center and I'll come back to talking about uh, what my influence is in terms of teaching that course and how it relates to, you know, um, the experience I had uh, taking the course when I was in Art Center in the mid 90s. So uh, teaching essential typography um, in terms of uh, that, that, um, that, that sheet that Simon was just showing you in terms of foundation, right? One of, the, one of the great things, I mean, I wish when I was at Art Center in the mid 90s that we have, or we had then uh, the level of typography courses that that Simon just showed you on that list and I'm proud to be a part of of the faculty who actually teaches that um, so in terms of uh, the type one and type two courses those are the first two classes I mean uh, and again this is really about type one and type two it's really about sort of the beginnings of, of sort of typographic practice right and sort of obeying the rules so there's a quote here that you can see. I'm not going to go through all this because I really want to get to showing some examples of this. Um, and at the, at the very bottom, you said so. So, so the the functions of typography in the basis of, of real good typography is, is is as mandated, right? To to preserve clearly and to represent the thoughts of the author. And I'm going to come back to that because in the undergraduate program, most of the students do not write the content they're actually using uh, in, in terms of their typography. In the graduate department, which is different the student becomes more of the author as opposed to getting content, right? So, and the, uh, the first, the type one class, um, um, basically the intro, to, it type, the intro to typography, right? I'm not gonna read the course summary, but it's the first course that students come in and take when they come to Art Center. Now, some students uh, come into Art Center with previous typography experience that they've taken at other, at other schools. And I, I, I will say that most of the time that the education they got at the previous schools um, sometimes have to be sort of reset. So when you come to Art Center as a student and you study typography and you take our foundation courses, we kind of get you to sort of reset, right? Um, and uh, starting with typography one, right? And so the, so the learning outcomes for typography one is introducing students to anatomy, a little bit of structure, content, concept making to concept making and more importantly typesetting right so each class as time as simon said before you get into type two you have to take the type one class type one is a prerequisite for type two so learning these basic basic skill sets uh in terms of an, uh anatomical terms of typography history uh understanding typographic structure anatomy typeface uh classifications things of that nature which i do some in my which i do uh, quite often in my type two class content, learning of just the fundamental skills of, of, of copy, tone, legibility, and things of that nature, and then concept, sort of employ conceptual creative thinking, thinking to typography. The conceptual part of type one, I mean, students don't really, really take a deep dive into concept until they get into some upper term uh, typography courses. And then obviously typesetting, uh, learning the digital and typesetting skills with Adobe InDesign using that, using that software. So um, this is a class I teach. It's, it's uh, typography to structure. It's the second in the sequence of, of the four to five foundation courses. Uh, and so the summary on here is type, type two is a rigorous introduction into the fundamentals of typography with emphasis on the formal aspects of designing with typographic elements and the responsibility inherent, inherent in working with language. I'm gonna come back to this idea of, of, of the responsibility of, of working with language when I talk about the type, I mean, the grad type one and type two courses, right? And so uh, here, what I do with my type two class is I, is there specific learning outcomes and emphasis that I place um, on the students and go over with students in the class. One is content management, right? Really getting students to analyzing and understanding information. Quite often when working with typography, students are excited about working with typography, but they don't necessarily really think about how important the actual information is and how you establish and break down that information before you start to uh, develop ideas and, and, and compositions and, that, and things of that nature. Spatial, spatial relationships, figure ground relationships, developing progressive layout and compositions by analyzing space. Quite often students don't understand spatial relationships. Um, and what I mean by that is even before you put anything on a page, 
looking at the format of the page itself and understanding the format and how that and how that changes the minute you put a typographic element in the compositional space. Scale, I'm sorry, scale and proportional relationships, large, medium, and small. Establishing hierarchy, hierarchy and, and emphasis through scale, understanding how scale changes, um, changes effect of composition uh, and affects compositional space. Typographic densities. This is a really interesting one here. Uh, background, foreground, middle ground. Establishing emphasis through dark and light. So the idea of typographic densities and what I like to teach with that is like how the space changes and how you establish this background, foreground, middle ground by the weight and the color, which we'll get to in a bit, uh, of, of the text and how it creates emphasis and hierarchy through that use. Rhythm and pacing. Uh, letting, kerning, and tracking. Establishing compositional variations and densities through letting, kerning, and tracking. Quite often, the first thing the students love to do when they take a type course is start to do, <laughs> is start to experiment with kerning and tracking and letting and do these really sort of uncontrollable compositions because they're really not understanding how, when you make those changes with, with that, how it affects the, the, the layout overall. Uh, typographic, or, typographic organizational systems. Uh, with the type two course, uh, it's important that students understand how to control content, right? So establishing content control and hierarchy through the use of grids and, and organizational systems as in the axial system, the radial system, and the dilatational systems. Now, in my type two class, I don't, I try to steer away from the radial and the dilatational systems, meaning allowing students to put text on curved and circular forms because what happens when they start to do that is they start to lose control over the composition and the layout. So I, so I really focus mostly on the grid system and the axial system and keeping the type on a traditional horizontal or sort of a vertical axis. Contrast and color. Uh, understanding legibility and density through the emphasis through color and contrast. This is a really interesting one because in my type two class, the work that's being done is done on the computer. So you see it in a digital context, but the work that they bring in the class has to be printed out and it has to be um, put on, the, on a wall for them to critique. That's changed now so, since we're doing everything um, digitally and, and, and through uh, remote teaching and learning. But what I, uh, what I want students to understand is color and contrast and how color and contrast is influenced by the technology, right? So it's important that they understand that and how it affects legibility and composition and things of that nature. And then finally, typeface recognition and terminology. Uh, develop progressive pro uh, typographic decision making through gain knowledge of font design, selection, and type choice, right? So um, a lot of students coming in, coming into Art Center, again, with the type one and type two classes, have this understanding of what they think good, good typography is. Uh, they come in normally with an archive of typefaces that they got from, from someone or one, once they collected over the years. And quite often they don't really understand what good versus bad type is. And so they learn this through type one, but we go over it a little bit more in type two and looking at especially type foundries, font designers, uh, the anatomy of typefaces, uh, the, the categories of typefaces, uh, you know, super families versus just one-offs, things of that nature. So this is a really important skill set that they need to, need to understand. Um, so in my type two class, the, the project that we do, the first project that we do is a, basically a series of, of typographic exercises. And what that is based on is giving students the, the, uh, the idea and, the, and making them understand how to work with content in a specific, in a specific area uh, and workspace. And this is, a, this is, a, this is a, just a, a, a sheet here showing what the workspace is about, what the parameters are for that, that, that project, right? We'll go back, I'll go over that a little bit more in detail when we do the breakout session. Uh, but this is overall here is, a, is, a, is a, um, a photo of the actual workspace that they work in, right? So what you see here is a 7.5 square format with a four column grid being um, four columns in four rows, and then a 30% uh, a gray background over the eight, four, eight and a half by 11 page size. The work that's done and the studies that are done are, are, are focused in the white area, the live area, uh, and the gray area gives the student the, the ability to just, just to really see how they're controlling their space in that live area. And so they cannot go outside of the live area into uh, that gray area. So that 7.5 space is the same space that they have to use for every single study that they do. And for that first project, it's called Typographic Structures in Eight Phases. 
uh, and this is a, is a list of the eight phases that they do. Each phase is built, is designed to build on the next phase. Phase one starts with one size, one weight, and it goes all the way down to phase eight, which is, so you're starting really basic, really basic with phase one, phase two, and phase three. Phase two, one size, two weights. Phase three, two size, one weight, use of space and, uh, uh, space and type size. Phase four, any single point size that you can use using the light, Roman bold, and italic. Phase five is the first time in the project where I actually add a, another element into the, um, into the project. The first four phases, it's, it's just typography. They were not allowed to use any other visual elements. No shapes, no lines, no illustrations, no photography, no, any of that. And then from phase five all the way down to phase eight, every phase gets uh, another element gets added. Phase six gets, uh, gets uh, type blocks and shape. And then phase seven, we introduce color and transparency. And then phase eight, after you've done phase one through phase seven, you go to phase eight, and here's where you get to experiment a little bit more. Here's where you get to learn all the, all the elements that you did in, from phase one to phase seven and all the skill sets that you worked on to know through those first seven phases. You apply those to phase eight. Now, experimental expressive uh, is to a degree it, the hardest to do because the more freedom you have that I've, that I've learned is that the more difficulty you have in terms of controlling text, right? Um, so, so this project is geared and designed to give them the skill sets that will allow them to, even though you get more, more uh, complexity with adding imagery, you can, actually still, you can actually still control your content. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some examples of, of that first project uh, the type two structures project. So here's some of the studies from that first, that project, right? Um, uh, typographic structures in eight phases, and those are a list of all the eight phases, right? So uh, here's some of the studies that are from that phase. So what you're gonna see here is this idea of controlling content and analyzing content and putting it into groupings of, of, of text. And the idea here is, is, to, is to first get students to learn how to look at content and how to organize and group content into like-minded um, elements, right? Or, or content, right? Um, so here, the idea is that you control content, but you do, you, every student does 15 studies for each phase. And the idea here is to, is, to, is to make them as different from one another as possible, but still having control over the content. So um, again, here's, here's a study using, that's a study using the grid system, there's a study using the axial system where, where every, all the content is to the left and to the right of a central axis. But if you notice in these studies, in the first, four, in the first few phases, they're, 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 they're um, keeping their groupings to a minimum, four to five groupings, and I make them do that so they can really take a look at how they can create hierarchy and, uh, through uh, smaller groupings. And what they, but what they can do is they can change their rhythm and pacing through, through, through letting, right? If you look at this study, for example, in the second grouping um, published by, you can see how more open that letting is as opposed to the indices issue and features, right? And so here uh, is that axial system again, but it's just changing the orientation. And again, looking at spatial relationships, um, quite often when students first do this, come into Art Center and they do these projects, they wanna take up the whole 7.5 square, um, uh, compositional space. And what the idea here is, is getting them to understand how white space figure ground relationships allows them to control content a little bit more. So I'm just going to go through. So that's phase one. And then phase two. Uh, and Oh, also, this is really important. So before the students actually do their studies on the computer, I make them sketch out their ideas in what we call ideational sketches just so they can get an idea of figure ground relationships and the use of space and how they create emphasis before they actually put, uh, go onto the computer and start designing these things, right? So the, the sketches are really, really important. Um, so this is phase two. In phase two, we change the weights. Uh, we add a different weight, uh, creating emphasis with uh, using bold and regular together. So here's where, we, where, where I put an emphasis on typographic densities, meaning uh, light versus dark, right? So as opposed to here where students are using the bold text on some of the groupings down here and as a, and then here changing uh, and using the bold and the regular together to create light and dark densities together, uh, which gives the, the composition a little bit more interest. 
uh, using the bold again on the most obvious uh, and the most uh, obvious parts of the of the content arts and architecture in this issue and, and features. But as you can see, again, the idea of controlling the comp compositional space works well when you when you keep the groupings to a minimum. Um, so there's the again there's the using the light and bold together creating using typographic densities, and here's phase three where uh, the point size are starting to increase. So as they progress down the phases, what happens is every phase is challenging, right? So here, you're actually using uh, two different point sizes, right? So how do you create emphasis and how do you control text when the point sizes get larger? And also, what I keep reminding students when we get to this phase is, in a 7.5 square, especially when your type gets larger, what happens is your compositional space reduces, right? It, it shrinks. And so how do you control content and a space where your space is getting chewed up through larger point sizes. And so what you see here is how you can, can you, how you can control compositional space with larger and smaller text elements, right? Um, and then going down into uh, phase four, any single point sizes using um, where I give, the, it says any single point size, but that's not necessarily true. I don't allow them to do any single point size because they still are at that, at that stage in their uh, typographic education where they're not really sure about how point sizes work well together. So I give them a, a, um, a, a series of point sizes that they can use for this phase for them to play around with. Um, and so what you see here again is, is, is two different point sizes and create an emphasis on the text using point sizes, large versus small, uh, to create emphasis. And there are the sketches. Uh, and then phase five, any single what? any single uh, any size weights using rules and lines now this is the first time the students actually get a visual element other than the typographic element now normally when students first get this idea oh i get to use some elements some rules and lines the first thing they want to do is make illustrations with the rules and lines and before we do this project i go over it with them uh, in detail and i tell them the purpose of the rules and lines is to is to be used as a system as and as a graphic element to create emphasis on the content, not just as a purely visual um, element. And so what you see here is, it, and, they, and I give them a certain amount of weights that they can use here. The smallest weight they can use is 0.133. And I think the largest, uh, the biggest weight of the, of the rules they can use is, is four point, right? So you can see some smaller point sizes and some heavier point sizes here and here. Um, and then going into phase number six, so um, any, single, any single point size and weight using reversed out type blocks and shape. This is probably the most difficult uh, phase at the, uh, for them to, to do because now I'm asking them to use larger shapes and having reversed out text to create emphasis on, this, on the text. The issue with quite often with this is having students understand uh, figure ground relationships and what happens to the compositional space when you put shapes in it, but also how your text works with the shape as opposed to competing with it, right? So what I make them do is stay simple. Geometric shapes, simple with your shapes, to actually create emphasis on the content and actually it inactivates a lot of the type uh, in, some of these, in some of these compositions. And as you can see, they could get really, really large with their point sizes. But the idea here is, again, using shapes and reverse style text to create emphasis on the, on the type. Uh, and, and again, how the figure ground relationship works. Um, and so again, using just simple layouts and using grid systems with these visual elements also uh, give students this, this, this practice of understanding how to control content. And then and, and, and number seven, basically it's the same as number six, phase six, but actually now we're adding color. And how does color influence and uh, influence composition and how do you use color to create emphasis, right? So uh, and, uh, in this, in this um, phase, I, I keep this phase down to one color plus black. They can also use white. So I don't give them a, a variety of colors that they can use, but they can use one color plus black for each study. Again, uh, showing control over the content in the layout, using the, the color to create emphasis. Uh, and here on this one, obviously the color as a background um, uh, shape, basically creating this, this sort of uh, base for all the other content to work on. Contrast with color looking at how, uh, for example, the color, the contrast of the color that's chosen here, how well does the black and white text work over that? So color and contrast is obviously really, really key, especially in, in this example, again, one color plus black. 
Um, again, and also controlling content through uh, the axial system, the organizational systems, including the axial system or the grid system. Uh, another one color plus black. And then there was, this, and then the final phase, which is probably the most difficult phase, but after they go through phases one through seven, now they get to use imagery. So they can experiment a little bit here. I will let them open up the kerning. I'll let them play with, manipulate the tracking to get a little bit more interest, create a little bit more experimentation with the layouts, but they still have to have control over the content, right? It still needs to be somewhat legible. So in this phase, what students do is they, they go and I, we talk about how imagery affects composition, quality of the imagery, cropping of the imagery um, in terms of, of, of what, what elements you need to keep in the imagery or not. And again, still controlling the content. Scale is really important here. Large versus small. Um, and these compositions we talk about when you have a large photograph, photographic element, your text, if you make your text big as well, what's going to happen is, that, is those two elements are going to compete with each other. And how do you control compositional space through scale as well, especially when you're using other elements like photography and illustration and things of that nature. So beautiful, I love this house, by the way. Um, uh, so, so that's the last phase of that project. So um, in a, you know, that's in a nutshell, that's the type two, which, oh, that's the type, that's the other class I'll come back to in a bit, the, the grad type one class. But in a, in a nutshell, uh, that is the exercises for the first project in uh, the type two course. They get to do two projects uh, in that course, the type one, uh, I'm sorry, the first project is the type structures in eight phases. And the second project they do is a type specimen promotional booklet, which I, don't, I didn't show samples of. So I just, right at my 20 minutes, I did good. Gloria. You did good, um, but uh, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't be back here. It's really Simon now who's um, on to the next uh, part. Okay. Simon, I'm Sharing going to Sharing screen right now. Okay, good. Um, right, so thank you, Ty, for that overview of type one and two. I would say I taught type two as well myself for a number of years, and I think the main point at which students change, I think, is when they suddenly have that understanding that... Um, it's the control of negative space. They, they come into typography thinking it's all about the typefaces. If I use a cool typeface, therefore it will be cool. Um, but they've got to understand that it's not really typography until they have control over that negative space. It's the control of the white space, the negative space, which is half of typography. And um, that it's not background, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's something they have control over. It's like the space between the notes in music. Um, once they have that understanding and they realize they're in, in charge and in control of that negative space, then things start to, ha to, start to happen. Um, a note about um, type three. I, I didn't, when I gave you the overview of the curriculum, mention about the, the little sort of suffixes that we put at the end of the classes. So type two is, type one is foundation, type two is structure, and type three is context. So having gone through um, the pretty rigorous exercises uh, in, in type two, and uh, necessarily so, as I mentioned before, um, the rigor is important for them to get a clear understanding of structures, hierarchy, um, sequence, grouping, all of those things that Ty mentioned. Um, having done that with provided material, and um, then in type three, we start to make those decisions based on different types of content and content. This is a, a quick screen grab from the perfectly charming syllabus sheet that the school puts together. Um, but um, just a brief glance at the top, um, the learning outcomes, uh, students in type three, they need to be able to use content and context to determine typographic choices, reinforce and refine formal typographic skills from type one and two understand grid systems, work with complex text materials, develop type and image combination skills, and develop analytical skills in relation to solving formal problems. Um, so th there are basically three assignments um, that, are, that I give in, in type three. Um, I think it's important at this stage that they're not working on one long project, that they've got a number of different projects to work on. Uh, the projects are deliberately geared towards stretching their skills in different areas. Um, Firstly, I think it's possible to identify with most students that there are certain areas that they are a little bit afraid of, a little bit scared of. And I would say working with quantities of text is one of those things. Uh, working with grids uh, is another of those things and maybe extreme scale. Um, 
Dell have had some experience with grids, but when it comes to more complex text material, uh, it's one of those things where they have to be um, ready and, and uh, uh, able to lose that fear. Um, the, they have to get to the point where they understand that working with grids, uh, grids are tools of liberation. They're not things that stop you being creative. Um, and once they understand that through working with them, I think uh, they, again, turn the corner. Um, the first project is eight page uh, of, of text driven material for a writer, um, eight pages plus, plus cover. It's all one color. Um, I would say that um, a number of the early projects that I give, that we give in, in school are, um, deliberately working with quite strict parameters. Um, I believe that working with parameters is a good discipline for, for all designers when they're, when, when they're learning. It's, it's learning how parameters should not be perceived as things that are stopping you being creative. They're actually catalysts for design and catalysts for creativity. So if, for example, you can only use one color. So we're getting them to start thinking about, about budgets and about parameters, and this is all print-based. Um, uh, we're getting them to start thinking about, well, if I've only got one color, what can I do with it? Um, you know, obviously you, you, they can work with different colored papers. Um, but we're working predominantly with, um, uh, I, I typically give them and we, we talk through uh, a five column grid on a letter size page. We look at variations of them. I have them analyze existing books and magazines by putting tracing paper over the top, um, seeing if they can analyze and work out the grid of the publication. Um, seeing whether those publications are done using millimeters or pikers and points and so forth is always kind of intriguing. Um, and really giving them a deep dive into how um, typographical structure uh, works over um, multi-page documents. Admittedly, it's only eight pages, but it's enough to give them a taste of how these things uh, work. Um, I, th I think as well, uh, starting to work with different contexts. They're trying to start thinking about typefaces in relation to particular contexts and materials. So with, with this writer series, they're having to think about um, time periods um, and geographical locations. If they're working with a, um, an American writer or a European writer, if it's from the 30s or the, or the, or the 1880s, um, how, do you, how do you go about making typeface choices that maybe connect to that subject matter somehow that start to do a little bit of work of expressing um, the content without necessarily going into historical pastiche, for example. Um, issues of typeface combinations come up. Um, what's a real, what's a text typeface? When do display faces not work as text? Um, what kind of more complex material uh, images, captions? When we start this project, we don't have any images here. Um, we, we just work with uh, grids and um, refining the text, um, refining the typeface choices, learning what doesn't work for a certain writer or a certain time period. Um, what might work for Walt Whitman might not work for Maya Angelou. Um, and so it's an interesting, we start to get into cultural discussions about how certain display typefaces are capable of having a bit more, let's say, personality. And therefore, when you're looking at a spread like this, it's, it's the, it's the not the text typeface so much as the display typeface that that is the predominant the loudest voice and so making those combination choices between two typefaces um is an interesting one we talk about how you know as soon as you get into three or four typefaces it gets harder because it's it's like it's like juggling i can i can juggle two things but give me three and four and that's not going to happen um finding the right tone of voice for certain situations um learning how to be comfortable with volumes of type how much is too much, um, issues relating to, um, you know, when is there too much going on? When is there not enough going on? When is it too dry and dull? When does it need more drama or interest? When is it going too far? When have I gone too far as a designer? Do I have too many things going on? At what point does something reach, reach that? When do I have to kind of pull back? Um, we talk about issues in both this class and the next couple of projects that I'll be showing you to do with um, the fact that we're all the time in design, we're making visual equations. And within those equations, um, there's no such thing as an unimportant detail. You know, the six point credit on a poster is just as important as the huge display headline, where it sits. In every, every element has a relationship with every other element. 
Um, just getting them to go through this process of analyzing their own work, um, talking about it in, in crits, um, sharing opinions with others. I'll talk about that more at the end, but their ability to verbalize the visual, spe specifically when it comes to typographic material, um, to talk through their, their, their concepts and their, and their thinking uh, is, is very critical. Um, as, as Ty touched on, this is all about language. We, we talk very much about how designers, I'll talk more about this project in a minute, but I think it's very important that um, students recognize that as designers, they're, they're sort of in the, in the middle between, let's say, the author and the audience. They take that raw information, they give shape to it. Um, in a way, we are translators. We translate that material to, to, the, to the audience. So we have responsibilities both to the author and to the audience. In a way, you could argue we also have responsibilities to ourselves to be doing interesting creative work, to make the work um, work for the voice of the author and for the eye of the audience. Um, but at the same time, you know, we can't go too far with that. Um, what I mean by that is we have to be careful as designers that the work doesn't become, shall I, shall I say, about ourselves. Um, inevitably, we all have to make choices um, about sizes, typefaces, and design moves, but ultimately, also part of that process, I think, should be what I would refer to as a sublimation of the ego. That is, you're serving both the audience and the author. Um, the author's words need to be respected. You can't just take it over and do your own thing and saying, look at me waving my flag, I'm being a designer. Uh, it's got to work in that situation. So it's a, it's a how should we say, it's a, it's a, you're not an artist as a designer. You're, 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 that's a longer discussion. You're, you're, you're a designer uh, in the service of language, but um, obviously it's, it's, it's creativity too. So something has to look like something. So we make, we make choices and things. Um, but in, in that process, I guess what I'm saying is that it's important that the students learn that uh, they can't just do what they want. It needs to have, it needs to feel right for the subject matter. It needs to become a voice for the subject matter and for the author. Respect the language that it's working with. It's in the service of that language. And so how do we go about making type choices relating to that? Um, the second project that I set them after the text heavy one is more about type and image combined. Obviously, this is the core of almost all graphic design. We're always putting type and image together. So what are the means and methods and, te and techniques that we can uh, do to do that? So I give them a, um, this project is a little bit tricky in the sense that it's not just make a poster. Um, it's, a, it's for a film series, they have to research the films, we talk about the films, uh, it's a little bit of film education on the side. Um, but we also um, have some technical issues to deal with here. So in this case, the first project was one color, the second project is always two colors. So we get to talk about print technology, um, mixing of inks, the difference between transparent inks and um, uh, and also with this project, um, it's further complicated by the fact that um, the, the same poster then has to become a brochure. Um, so the same thing cut down uh, is then becoming uh, a 12 page brochure. So the sequence has to work chronologically uh, as well as, so it has to function as a poster and a brochure. So this is quite deliberately tricky. Um, for, for, for specific, specific reasons. Um, I'm not just being awkward for the sake, for the sake of it. Um, the point about the brochure is that you can't, when you're looking at it on screen, you can't see what the brochure is gonna look like. You've gotta make a design, you've gotta then print it out, cut it up, turn it into a brochure form, and look at that to see how that's working. Uh, and so it makes the students work outside of the computer and not just inside of the computer. I think that's something that's a fundamental understanding that students need to realize that design isn't just something that happens on a computer. Um, you know, you can have totally different design ideas um, by working on something outside of the computer. And it's important that they have that in their vocabulary. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's an interesting project in that sense. They have to solve the two color issue. They have to solve the display and text typography issue. They have to solve the contextual feeling of the issue. Um, you know, in this case, post-war Italian cinema. Um, so what, what sensibility, what typefaces, what feeling might work for that? Not just linking it to that time period, but also making it relevant for an audience now. So it has to do that bridging job uh, in terms of sort of chronologically. Um, 
a lot of design problems, I, I think, are like that. You've got to make a connection to the subject matter, which may be geographical, it may, may be time-based, but then it's also got to appear to be coming out now. It's got to be current communication, so it's got to work for us um, right now. So these are a, a, a series of different uh, iterations of the, basically the same project. Um, typically, um, the students have the hardest challenge in finding ways to make small type work over the top of images. So um, we talk about control of tonal value. This is the key to, to this. Um, either lightening or darkening images or introduction, in, in introducing different uh, tonal values, as you'll see in some of these issues here. For example, the other future uh, pink poster on the left there, the flood of magenta is what makes uh, over the top of the transparent image, makes the image still visible, but also makes the white type the small white type uh, capable of being read. So there's certain technical things that we deal with there that, that enable type and image to, to coexist. Uh, here's one final example of uh, a poster where we get to see a little bit of the brochure, how it's cut down. Um, so it has to work in both ways. So in a way, this is one project where we're trying to cover a lot of ground at the same time. This is a planning issue as well. Design is planning. Um, and so, that's the second uh, assignment. Um, the third assignment uh, has to do with, so first one about text and grids, second one about type and image combined. The third one is about predominantly about type and identity. So in a way, this is before they'll have taken communication design four, which is specifically identity design. I didn't call it branding. We can talk about that, but um, branding is too broad a word, um, not a useful word. Um, so in this case, typographic identities, um, Generally speaking, for the most part, I ask them to come up with identities for typography conferences. Um, it, it's a little bit incestuous, but it's a little bit meta. But again, for a reason, um, I want them to come up with an identity for something for a conference that they would actually want to go to themselves um, that would be uh, of interest. Um, so that they're the audience, I'm the audience, all of us that are involved in typography are the audience. So it's, it's got to feel like it's got a connection to the feel, the subject of typography, but also feel contemporary and fresh and different. And as with any identity, um, it's got to have some personality. It's got to stand out from whatever else is out there. It's got to feel a little bit unique somehow. So within this um, project, what we also do, um, it's a very quick project. We only have um, four weeks total for this. Um, I think the first one was six weeks. The second, uh, the, the film poster was that's my math, five weeks, um, and then just four weeks for this one. So it happens pretty quickly. It's all in black and white. They've got to come up with, in the first week, quite initial ideas that, and then we, we focus in on, on three or four that have potential and then review them and then come back the next week. Um, I've, I've mentioned uh, a, a little bit later on, but it's worth mentioning a, a few things about, um, in-class protocols, what, I, what I've been trying to do a little bit more recently, which I found has worked. So for example, when they come in one week, we might finish the crit on the film posters and then I'll, I'll be overlapping that with this project. So they'll come in with first ideas for these typographic identities um, in that same week. Um, and the, the following week, they might come in with then revisions for, for, and new ideas. And what we'll do is try and have a sort of what I call a speed crit uh, at the beginning of class. So everything is timed. So each student might get you know, seven or eight minutes, an alarm goes off, and then we move on to the next one. So it's trying to be fair and equitable, but equally allowing enough time so that um, once we've had that crit at the beginning of class, we then have a period within the class where the students on the laptops are working on revisions to that identity that we've talked about. Because it's a quick class, it's useful, I find, to have a working period, working session, session in class, um, and then we can see changes, we can see the design developments at the end of class. Uh, we can see how someone's logo, logo may have developed and changed just within that one, one period. So um, I should point out as well that in addition to being an identity, what I also try and encourage them to think of is the idea of um, that identity, the logo doesn't have to be just a thing on its own, separate from other elements, that it can become the beginning of a, a typographic system. So within the posters here, we're starting to see how the mark itself can then be used as also um, a typographic system. So you, the type Oslo one on the left, you'll see how that idea of kind of a field that blocks out part of the characters then carries through and essentially happens to the whole alphabet though. So, so the identity becomes uh, a system in that place, which can then be used for other language. 
um, such as signage if they had time to do that, or if you were developing a, a website, for example. Um, I only asked them to do a poster, a t-shirt, and some of them come in with, with bags as well, but then attendee badges. So we can start to see how the idea of an identity might be applied in different situations. Obviously, later on in the full identity class, um, we th it's then taken into, you know, it's a different project, obviously, but it then goes into um, websites and environmental applications and, and so on. Um, worth pointing out as well before I finish um, that another component here uh, of this project is the idea of um, scale. And I think an important change in their understanding happens, and I, I, I notice it myself because we start with the text uh, project, the writer's project. Um, that would be what I refer, would refer to as private communication in the sense that one person is reading that book, it's at a certain distance from us. That sense of typographic decision-making is different from what I would call this now, which is public communication. So as soon as you get into posters and, and certainly larger scale elements like this, the idea of it becoming public communication is, is, is a slightly different, different mindset, how something reads from a distance. Um, posters need to operate on a different level than something that's book form. Um, they need to operate on a level that's first and foremost, what you might call iconic. Can it grab you from a distance, you know, 100 yards down the street, across the room, whatever it might be? Does it grab you first on that iconic level? And then secondly, does it work on a detail level when you're up close and looking at the material? So. Uh, the scale issue is important. These things are six foot by three foot, uh, tall, cheap, cheap die line prints. Um, but essentially it enables us to cover the walls. And these are all in, uh, these are all in HMCT. So they become wallpaper. Each poster is done as a positive and a negative and then just flows around the room. So we then become immersed in those identities and we can talk about how they're working and uh, evaluate them for you know, how well they work as systems, how well they work as um, identities in themselves, how well they might work as um, giving a feeling of the contemporary, whatever that might, might be. It's a slippery thing, but it's interesting to um, see how they deal with that. Um, so the important thing about type three is uh, through, that, through that range of, of, of studies is to stretch the skills, to build on what uh, they've done in type one and type two, but to add now context to it so uh, different subject matters trying to find typographic voices that work for um, different subjects um, obviously it's the, you know the standard problems that we all that we all face but now they're they're, they're stretching their skills in some cases they're building new letter forms uh, for these uh, projects not complex we don't have time for that um, but um, we actually do get into a, a slightly more complex version of that in a project I set in type 4 which we'll get on to in a minute. Um, I believe, um, I mean, there's a few other things, just notes that I would want to encourage students to think about in type, in type three. Um, I, I, you know, we've touched on some of them, but a couple of fundamental things that I think to be a good typographer, you have to care about language. Um, you have to have read everything. You have to really know where your decisions are coming from. Uh, once you've, you know, if you're doing something on Hemingway and you've, or New Wave Cinema, if you've read up about it a lot, um, then even before you start designing, then your decisions are going to come from a place of understanding. Uh, and that's so basic and important, but it's easily, easily forgotten. Um, so caring about language is, is um, totally uh, uh, important for a typographer. Um, and uh, I think... Possibly that's enough for the moment. It's, Gloria, how am I doing for timing? You're, you're uh, over. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, then let's... You're pushing. Let's, sorry. Right, so let's, let's push on. <laughs> let's switch, uh, switch back. On to tie. On to tie. All right. Um, so going into um, grad type one and grad type two, um, from the undergraduate grad type... I'm sorry, grad type one and grad type two from the undergraduate... Uh, undergraduate type one and type two courses. Uh, with the grad type one and the grad type two classes, I mean, grad type is a different animal. Um, and teaching uh, a typography class uh, to most of the students coming into the graduate program, uh, are not, not most of them, but several of them don't have a lot of typography experience. So uh, what I have to do is it was sort of a crash course in type two 
and my grad type one course to get them sort of up to speed on some of the basic fundamentals of typography before we get into sort of the more complex uh, and more experimental um, ideas of, of, of type image and, and language and storytelling, right? So, um, so there's two, obviously there's two uh, undergraduate courses, grad type one and grad type two. Uh, what, what I do in the grad type one, which is, is, is what I don't do in the grad type two, is in both of these courses, basically, I focus on several things. One is content management. Again, this comes from the grad type two course. Really getting these students, especially in the grad type one course, to understand, you know, how to break content down uh, and how to establish hierarchy uh, within content, and really analyzing information uh, as opposed to uh, uh, as they analyze information. Obviously, the idea here is is to sort of create some sort of uh, of hierarchy and uh, methodology for using that content in the projects that they're going to be using or projects they're going to be doing. Spatial relationships, again, going back to what we talked about earlier, uh, developing pro progressive layout and compositions by analyzing space. In the grad type courses, um, I, I try to give students a lot more freedom and I'll come back to talking about that in a minute when I talk about both of these classes. Uh, um, but it's really important for them to understand spatial relationships, right? Developing progressive layouts and compositions to analyze in space. Scale and proportional relationships, which I talked about earlier in the grad type, uh, in, the, in the type one class, type two class. Uh, establishing hierarchy and emphasis through scale, understanding how scale changes and affects compositional space. Uh, typographic organizational systems, uh, I do like to introduce them to those systems when they come into the grad type one class, especially for many of those students who haven't really had much um, experience in typography. So in our graduate program, which is fairly young, uh, a lot of the students that come into the graduate uh, graphic design program come in from other majors. They may have studied science, they may have studied literature, things of that nature. And a lot of them haven't had a lot of uh, typographic and design experience. So my job is to try to get them up to speed uh, with the, some of the basic skill sets as, as quickly as possible. Uh, and then typeface recognition and terminology. Uh, so this is all uh, from, the type, from the type two course, basic things that I do in the uh, grad type one course. And then we get into, um, this is not from the type two of course, by the way, um, understanding language structures, right? So when they come into the graduate program, the idea here is that, you know, graduate study and graduate, uh, our graduate program really should be about this idea of questioning and exploring, and especially with thesis, this is not a thesis course, but this idea of really, really soul searching, right? So developing an understanding of various language structures as tools to, uh, as tools in storytelling and communicating subject matter. So in the grad type one and grad type two courses, what we do a lot of is basically storytelling and, and narrative and, and developing stories through research and, and uh, serious hardcore um, development of, of writing structures. And so that's important, a sk important skill set for them to develop as they go through the grad type one, grad type two course. Developing typographic narrative, developing clear effective communication skills using research and your own language, writing in turn giving voice to the subject matter. So this is what I was talking about earlier. Most of the content that the other graduate students, undergraduate students get uh, that they use is not content that they've written. So it, they're not the author of the content. That's different in the graduate program. So in the graduate program, what we're doing is, is, is uh, guiding students this idea of developing their own content through research and analysis so, become, so that they become the author of their content, right? And they, so that they, create a, they gain a greater understanding of the language, the structure, and the narrative, and how they're going to develop that into, into uh, the projects that we do. Developing a typographic voice. Establishing a typographic voice and visual language through, focus, through a focused narrative. So and again, going back to what I was talking about earlier in the grad type two course. I mean, when I, when I was a student at Art Center, again, um, you know, the idea of typographic structure was not, that, it was not that important to me or not interesting to me until I realized later that how important it actually was. I was, more imp I was more interested in developing my typographic voice based on the, the, the design that I was seeing at the time and reacting to the sort of zeitgeist of contemporary graphic design or graphic design in the 90s, right? So this idea of developing a typographic voice is something that 
I want to push the graduate students to do, but do it under the, you know, with, with control through the skill sets that they learn uh, with that crash course in, in type two, so that they don't necessarily just go out and start developing projects and, and start prototyping ideas with no control over what they're doing, uh, but just, just making it basically a, uh, using visual language and basically trying to, trying to create a look and a feel to it that has no meaning to the actual narrative, right? So we talk about typographic voice, typographic voice based on a focused narrative. Effective research and writing, a story development, right? So what I do with my grad type uh, uh, one and two classes is I do work, writing workshops. I have um, Polly Geller who teaches writing workshops at our at Art Center come in and spend time with my students doing writing workshops and working with them on developing their narrative through their research. And that's really, really important because that is, the idea here is, is, is that you're taking research and analysis and you're creating a narrative from that. But in, more importantly, is the writing good, right? Um, so having the writing workshops prepare, help students prepare themselves for actually taking that content and starting to go into concept development and prototyping. And then uh, typographic synergy across various mediums or media or media platforms. So in my grad type two course, uh, the students take a project and they um, and they develop a typographic narrative that they have to um, articulate and execute across three basic media platforms. One is a trad traditional print map platform, uh, a digital platform, meaning a motion graphic or a uh, and then also a spatial um, uh, project or spatial execution of that narrative. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples of that in a second. It shows you how they they do that across three media uh, three media platforms. And so these so for my grad type one class, uh, I do the I do that crash course of of, of the type two uh, project uh, type two structures project. But also I do something with them in that course that allows them a lot more typographic expression than I, that I don't do in the, in the type two class. And that's by using uh, um, a typographic morphology. And a typographic morphology allows students um, this sort of system to explore typographic expression, but still having control, right? So, and then the, and the, and the, uh, the morphology has a series of variables in it, right? And some of the categories are typogra typographic form, space, typographic support. But then within those, and here's the morphology itself. So within those, those, those different categories, there are various parameters that you can use in terms of typographic factors, for example. For example, typographic case, upper, lower combination, uh, typeface, serif, sans serif scripts, eccentric combination. So the four categories, within those four categories, you have specific um, parameters that you can use within those. But then also, you know, as you see in these black areas, you can cr actually create your own. So, the idea of the morphology, especially in the, in the grad type one class, uh, as they're doing the, the structures phases, gives them the ability to sort of break out of that, the context of, of just the type two course uh, idea and, and the structure. So let me show you some examples of, of that um, here. Um, so here's some, here's some examples of the grad type one class using the morphology. So uh, I give them two, two phases of this, this project. So, morph uh, so factors one and morphology factors one and morphology factors two. And so it, like in the grad, I mean, sorry, like in the undergraduate uh, program, the grad, I mean, sorry, the, the type one and the type two course, especially my type two, I tell them to sketch their studies first. Now with, with the morphology phases, um, so they've done the crash course, before they do the morphology phase, they do, several of the type two phases as well. And then they do this phase at last. And I just didn't want to show any of those because with those, we showed those in the type two course. So here they're allowed to take and explore a little bit more possibility uh, in terms of expression, uh, but after they've done those uh, previous studies, but now they have the ability to, uh, with that morphology um, is to explore different, uh, different ways of prototyping and, and making with their, with their typography, right? So, um, these are, these are from the grad type one, uh, typographic morphology. And again, the idea here is that you can, you can tape, you can take and you can have a little bit more, um, expression and you can, um, break out a little bit more from the structure of, of the type two course, but still once they do that type course, type two course, uh, and that really that crash course in the type two, uh, project, 
coming to this morphology phase allows them to have uh, some control over the text, but also experiment and explore other possibilities through the morphology phases. And so um, this assignment was based on um, doing the studies from the type two course, but using um, the, uh, the context of Fuse 120 by Neville Brody um, and using some of the fonts from that, from Fuse 120 they had to use. And as you can see, there's an actual serif font in there, if you can see that. Uh, actually, it was a slab serif, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so here, they really get to explore uh, and exp be much more expressive. But again, as they're doing this, they're still practicing a lot of the principles of, um, for example, scale, right? As you see here, contrast and color and compositional space, allowing text and room to breathe for the, allowing room to breathe for the elements that you're actually doing in, your, in terms of your composition, uh, creating emphasis through groupings and things of that nature. And again, more importantly, having control over scale, especially with large, medium, and small, uh, some of the content here um, is not as legible, obviously, because again, here, this is expressive. And what I'm getting them to do is just explore uh, alternative, alternative uh, ways of making, right? Prototyping using typographic form, which the undergraduate students don't get the opportunity to do. Uh, here's some blending being done with that study right there. Uh, and so again, they do 20 of these studies uh, for the morphology phases. Uh, again, this is in the grad type one class. Now, in the grad type two course, which is a, uh, a little bit different now, with, in the grad type two course, this is all about, um, you know, typographic voice and expression and narrative um, based on a subject matter and the writing that they actually um, do themselves based on that subject matter. So in the type, grad type two course, what they start out with is picking a subject matter and then uh, doing some research on that subject matter and developing a typographic narrative that they have to uh, articulate across three media types, right? And the first thing that they have to do is they have to do a series of 10 typographic posters. So this is a poster that was done on um, Quentin Tarantino uh, and his, and the way he, um, uh, creates narrative, especially with his, with his movies. And this one was more from Kill, the Kill Bill film. And I'll show you how this articulates across uh, another uh, media type. So here you're using both. So again, I'll, the other thing that I should say is visual language. What I also, we talk about here is establishing a really important visual language, visual language based on the narrative. Type is image, but also using imagery, whether illustration, or photography or any other uh, elements that you design to help articulate the narrative. So you're creating both a typographic narrative, but you're also using with that a visual language to help articulate this, this content and narrative, right? So, uh, so, and this has to be done across a series of 10 posters, right? And those, and then after that, what you need to do, what they do also is from that to articulate that same project across another media type is they have to do a, um, uh, a digital component or a animation. Uh, and so this is the animation that was done with for, um, for that Quentin Tarantino project. Hopefully this, the sound will play, I'm not sure if it will, but. It, Superman didn't become Superman. Superman was born Superman. When Superman wakes up in the morning, he's Superman. His alter ego is Clark Kent. His outfit with the big red S. That's the blanket he was wrapped in as a baby when the Kents found him. Those are his clothes. What Kent wears, the glasses, the business suit, that's the costume. As you can see, you can see how the visual language and the typographic language articulate across this moving uh, screen, right? So as opposed to the static, um, you know, context of a, a traditional print uh, media type, right? Um, and then let me show you one more. Um, so again, this is uh, from the grad type two course. 
uh, and this one, I'm going to show you the spatial context of this one. Uh, this is a, um, a project that a, um, a student did and focused on sound and sound visualization. Um, and this was done a few years ago. And so, again, just uh, creating a, a visual language and a typographic narrative uh, across uh, different media types. This person, the student also created a typeface from these sound visualizations she did from the letter forms. And we you actually took some of those and we used them in, um, in a spatial context, which I'm going to show you. I thought, so let me show you her, the, the motion piece for that one. And hopefully this one will play. And, and then finally, uh, here is, um, so, and what I do um, in my job as a director, one of the faculty directors at, uh, at the School of Architecture is, is my focus is also on spatial and doing interventions, the spatial interventions. And with the grad type two course, we actually um, did an infant intervention, uh, spatial intervention actually on one of our buildings at Art Center. And this is an intervention at the 1111 building, um, which is uh, on uh, Raymond Avenue. Um, and or actually the Royal and, and Raymond. Um, and so what we did was we had students take a particular part of the building and take their project and articulate that narrative uh, on the building. And so the idea here is that you, you really focus yourself and talk about what happens to text and type and scale when it changes, right? When it gets much, much larger. Most students don't have the, the opportunity to create a a, a actual physical installation of the project that they do actually in, in, in scale, right? So these students had the opportunity to do that actually at Art Center. And so, and so what you're seeing here is um, the, um, ex, the uh, spatial installation that we did in the 1111 building. This is in the parking garage. So again, here looking at the idea of, of, of how type changes when it gets to larger point, larger sizes like this, not just in point size, but I'm talking about in terms of feet, right? Um, like what happens when you, when you take type and you make it eight, six, eight feet tall and 20, 30 feet wide, and how does it articulate and how do you change your spacing and your kerning and your, to, to articulate that text well in that space, right? So these are spatial installations that are actually in the building on the walls uh, that came out of the grad type two course. Uh, and again, Every one of these students had to do a typographic narrative that worked across three, three media types, right? A traditional print, uh, a digital a motion piece, as well as a spatial component. And so this is actually in the elevator, um, the corridor in the elevator. Uh, this is actually in going up one of the stairwells inside the 1111 building. Uh, what happens to the type when you look at it in perspective? And then also we did a we did an intervention inside the building um, in the 1111 building through the stairwell. So, if you're ever at Art Center, when we when you actually can go back to um, to actually being in a space, do yourself a favor and go to Art Center, go to our 1111 building, and go through the stairwell. And there is a installation, a graphic installation that we did throughout the stairwell uh, in that building as well as the parking level one and the parking level two. So, and the grad type courses, again, my idea is to, is to push narrative, but also um, have students sort of think about how text and type works across various media types from some very small scale to really large scale projects. And I think that is it. Yes, that is it. We're, we're going to, we have about uh, 13, 15 minutes left to this session. And I know there's a lot of questions and you want to have a, a little uh, break and reprieve before you have to go into your classroom with every, with the people who are in that. So Simon, you're up to take us, take us to the finish line. Um, good. So to, to conclude, I actually neglected to show uh, the type four stuff last time. Um, so just very briefly, I know we're running out of time, but uh, I'm just going to go over the, the type four uh, projects. Um, 
there's a couple that I, that I give. Uh, it's a similar situation to um, what Ty was mentioning. Uh, some of the, pro I actually teach a, a, a grad type uh, one class as well. So these are the same projects that uh, actually are given in type four. So the first one is a, uh, basically a book design project. As we've talked about before, it's a book and an exhibition. They have, to, they have control over the subject matter. Um, as we've mentioned before, a lot of early exercises tend to be um, with very strict parameters, but uh, we want the students to feel like they have ownership of the content as soon as possible, as soon as we feel like they, they've got, you know, fundamental skills. Um, so in this, in this situation, they choose a subject matter. Often it's an art related, um, I, I'd make it about a cultural form of, 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 of some sort. And this person chose uh, the subject of uh, art and shamanism. They have to do a, a whole full publication. It's a deep dive. It's, it's basically uh, 11 to 12 weeks of a 14 week term. Um, they also have to do a, a poster and an exhibition um, entry uh, wall, shall we say for it. Um, so this project, did, did, this person did one on the faith cell, shamanism and transcendental experience. Um, I'm just going to flick through a few more of these. Um, this student did a fabulous one on uh, a project called Infinite Sound on the history of electronic music. So again, this tends to be now subjects. This is, this is fourth term and, and above. Uh, these happen to be from a, a grad version of it, but they they choose their subject matter. They do all of their own research. Uh, they're designing publications. They're designing an identity for this exhibition, um, and they uh, come up with. There's there's always a, a good, a totally different range of, of things going on. We have students from all sorts of different backgrounds, um, and so you get a very rich variety of different subjects. Everyone learns from each other's, I think, and. Um, so the poster and just a simple exhibition beginning. Um, someone did one on the Life uh, magazine exhibition and, and book. Um, so again, as I mentioned, it's, it's this, uh, once, as Ty has mentioned, once they're in control of their own subject matter, they're not writing this material, but they are researching and editing. And that's a major thing. I think as soon as students learn that they can be uh, editors as well, uh, it opens up the field of design to many more things than you know, at its simplest, sometimes design is making other people look good. But I think it's way more than that, obviously. And they learn that they can be editors, they can generate new, new projects, they learn that this expanded field of design can take them into starting their own companies or becoming uh, editors and designers and curators uh, all at the same time. So um, set the second project I wanted to show you was um, I, I give them uh, what I would call um, a modular typeface design or a functional um, uh, typeface design in the sense that they, I give them, they only have uh, four weeks to do this. They have to come up with a set of parameters for a typeface and then generate the whole typeface and generate a poster for it as well. So it's not about the quality of curves. It's not as sophisticated um, as what Greg gets up to in digital font design. Um, but it does mean that they have to come up with a system and then develop a series of letter forms and then uh, run with it and play with it and refine it in a short period of time. Um, so the, the parameters I, that I give them is that it I, the either needs to be based on a grid, it needs to be, it can be a monospace, as this one is, it doesn't have to be. Um, they have to be certain characteristics, certain moves that are followed throughout the, the, the typeface. So we go through a series of refinements in class, obviously, but it's pretty, pretty quick. Um, in terms of the amount of time that they have to work on these things. Uh, I'm particularly fond of, of that modular font. Um, but they vary. I mean, this, this one has the variables in this one. You know, the radius uh, is, is the same. We've got um, differing stroke thicknesses. It, it was either a two or three on, on the grid and it varies. So it's, it's got quite an interesting kind of funky feel to it. Uh, and they then have to come up with a poster that, uh, as it were, amplifies and uses language that amplifies the feeling that they were trying to create with the typeface. So, so the, the goal here is that the, the, is that the language, the form and the content kind of become one, ideally, in a pretty short space of time. Um, this student at Hampton did a pretty interesting study. Uh, geometric forms, really reduced forms, and it happened that we were starting to develop um, an exhibition uh, at the HMCT called um, Plan B, The Spirit of the Bauhaus. And I, I, I love this form so much that I asked him if we could use it for the, for the exhibition. And so ultimately a version of it became 
uh, the, the, the outline version that we used in the Plan B spirit of the Bauhaus kind of identity for the exhibition. Uh, so it's always interesting where those kind of experimental typefaces can go. This one is, is just fabulous and crazy. It's all based on this pentagram that you see down on the lower right. Sometimes I, I ask them to include a diagram of the, the sort of modular system that's used to create the typeface. So um, we can just about read here, Dawn of the Vampire. We enjoy the night, the darkness, where we can do things that are not acceptable in the light. Night is when we slake our thirst. How about that? You can just about read it. Um, it's it's kind of crazy, it's expressive, it's extreme, but it's interesting what these uh, different students come up with in, in that period of time. It follows the logic that I require them to follow. That is, it has a, a basic modular um, underlying visual logic. Um, and so it's always interesting to see where these, uh, these things go. This one is better seen at larger sizes. Uh, again, straightforward, circular and straight three-lined letter forms, but um, the feeling that it created seemed perfect for, I think, the students' favorite, favorite uh, albums from the 60s and 70s, I think. Um, so that, that's a quick project, but it gets them thinking about letter form shapes. Obviously, they're all display faces. They all follow their own internal logic. Um, they can only be used at larger sizes, but it gets them thinking about how to create new forms and new feelings. And sometimes they start with the feeling. Um, and uh, sometimes they, they, they just play with form and see where it leads them. Um, so it's an interesting experiment from that point of view. Um, well, that's it in terms of the type four class. So um, Ty and I, I guess we just wanted to conclude with um, just a few, th a few thoughts on if you are in a program where you only have a limited time period. We have a couple of situations where um, I've mentioned we have illustration students that have a f need to take some type classes. So they might only take type one and type two. We have another situation where, for example, a, a colleague of, of mine, Alison Goodman, teaches a, a design typography class for product design uh, majors. They only have time for one class um, that relates to graphics in some ways. So uh, in that class, she has to cover typography and uh, she gets them to do some text settings, some basic typesetting exercises, also type as, type as, as logo as well. She has them work on the logo. So, these were some ideas for if you do have a, a constrained period of time, how to compress. You know, we're, we're very lucky at Arts Center. We, we have um, the eight terms for students to work on these mm. things and can take yeah. multi multiple yeah. classes. Simon, do you mind yeah. I'm going to stop your share? Sure. If that's okay? Sure, of course. So we do have a, a lot of questions from people and it's going to sure. be hard to... Um, th there's a lot of questions and I think this is really interesting and I think a tie you can answer this in in like five seconds sure what typefaces do you assign just oh i actually sent somebody that uh I replied, oh good i replied good. to that okay. uh but you know uh, yeah. for sans serif uh accurat accidents grotesque um helvetica noia um meta sometimes so you know and and i think and, and i and, if and i can I, just if i can just add to that i think the yes. important thing about that is that with sans serifs you, you've, got, you've got stroke contrast built into this, the system, whereas, um, so you can vary the contrast. Whereas if you start with a, if you do that exercise with a serif, uh, which has thick, thin contrast happening within each letter form, it's much harder to create uh, contrast between bolds and light versions of them. So sans serifs, I think, work much better for those exercises for that reason. That's, that's exactly what I was going to say, Simon. Right. Okay. And, <laughs> and, and I think the other question too is, and I think the, one of the, the biggest questions, and we'll probably go more into detail in the classroom, is how does this methodology and pedagogy adapting to the digital environment? Because these, right. obviously, right. these exercises right. were right. Right. developed when you're able to print it out and you're yeah. able and so yeah, how's uh, it been adapting to this? Yeah, I, I, will, I will say, especially for my uh, type two class, I, I, it's adopted really well, actually. Um, and, you know, it's actually, you know, forced me to look at new ways of teaching and critiquing, um, which I really love, actually, which I, which some of those things, including using um, sharing programs like Miro, which I've been using for critiques, for critiques, 
um, it's, I will, I will use those and bring those back to the classroom. We get back to being physically in the, in the classroom space. Now, the, the only thing that still does not articulate is, as I was talking about earlier, is, I mean, seeing type on screen all the time now, because these students are not printing these phases out anymore, right? So what's happening is, and maybe I should make them print them just to look at them themselves, but what's happening is, you know, doing all of the studies and presenting them weekly just through a digital and remote format and on the screen, you're really not getting a chance to see what happens to the typography when it gets printed on paper, right? That sort of tactile quality to it. What happens to the letter strokes if you have really small, as Simon was saying, if you have a small sans serif at six point type, it's like when you print it out, is, are the serifs going to articulate when you print it, right? Depending on the, on the, on the technology and the printer that you use. So again, so we're not, students are not seeing that. They're not, they're not, the crits, the, the work is not being critted uh, in, in physical form. It's only being critted in digital form. And I think it's more, it's important for students to understand the difference between what they're seeing on the screen with typography and what it looks like when it's actually printed on paper. Hmm. I guess we'll have a, a, a maybe developed a great uh, group of digital typographers yeah. know at least what they see on the screen. Yeah. We, if I can add one thing, maybe maybe yes. one, maybe someone had a question. Uh, obviously, it's it's clear from the projects that we've been showing that for the most part, these are print based. Yeah. Um, and we believe that it's easier to learn the basics, the essentials, print based. I know we're looking at screens all the time on phones and laptops and all sorts of things. Uh, those things are addressed in other classes. As I mentioned, there are, there's a type four class that uh, which is interaction based and, and they're working on screen materials all the time. I understand that, you know, for example, where line spaces might work better for text if you're reading on a phone, um, but in print they don't. So we do deal with some of those issues in the classes, but we find that if you try and, I mean, I've tried this in information design classes, as soon as you try and putting too, too, many, too many projects on screen, you lose a lot of, basically you lose a lot of design time because you, you're wasting too much time on technology and not enough to, time on design right so, right and, so, and, and and i and i think um i think everyone has to understand this is new we this is only a, a, a semester and a half not even a full se this is our first full semester online right, right. last semester it, it at art center it ended halfway so we and and we don't look at this as a permanent environment perhaps mm -hmm. that you know but I, I think both Simon and Ty have been incredible and the other instructors at Art Center have been incredible to adapt within less than a week the same methodologies and pedagogies that they taught in person physically to um, to the digital environment with that I have to say because if, if I don't stop it now you're not going to have a chance to use okay. the restroom or have something to drink now you can bring your coffee into the classroom so thank you all for coming and those who are going to be in the classroom I, I will see you then and we're sorry we didn't get to the Q&A but as you know we're all kind of available at Art Center you can always find us if you want to and I promise you we will be doing this again probably not till the winter yeah, and I want to say thank everybody. Thank you to everyone who uh, who is here and participated. I mean, yeah, me too. It's really it's really great when we get to share um, the outcomes from our classes uh, with with the community. And this is kind of the first time, and maybe because of the the, the current culture we're, we're in. I mean, we're all having access to stuff that we we didn't have access to before. So thank you guys for all attending. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Ty, thank you. and thank you, Simon. Sure. I'm, I'm so happy that I was able to convince you to do this. <laughs> I wasn't convinced. I was forced. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for attending. That's okay. And I'll see you tomorrow. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Bye. Bye.